Today on Orthodox Ethos, the first of feasts, the beginning of redemption, the fear of death and bondage to the devil. We begin at the beginning with the Feast of Our Lord, the great Feast of the Annunciation, which most Orthodox Christians around the world are celebrating today, who follow the church calendar. It is a feast that reaches back into deep antiquity. It is witnessed to by St. John Chrysostom and Blessed Augustine already as an ancient feast, a, cu- a feast, a customary feast. And it was referred to by different names, the Conception of Christ, the Annunciation of Christ, the Beginning of Redemption, the Annunciation of the Angel to Mary, and other names. And we read in the Gospel for the feast the following. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God in the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came into her and said, Hail, or rejoice, thou art highly favored, and the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at the saying, and cast in her mind, What manner of salutation is this? And the angel said to her, Fear not. Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. The Lord God shall give Unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and as of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary to the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. And therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth She also has conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. This is the gospel of the feast that many of you heard this morning. If you were able to go to church, or at least online, Here we see that the very incarnation, the very economy of our salvation, the beginning of our salvation, has its presuppositions. We're not going to do a full exegesis of this text, obviously. We're going to focus on certain things that I think are timely for us in this day and age. It has its presuppositions. Some of them are a pure temple, of course, the mother of God, in which to dwell God, purification through unceasing prayer, abstinence, keeping the commandments, humility and obedience on the part of the mother of God, a yes to the will of God, crucifying the intellect and rationalism, no willfulness, trust, faith, entrusting herself to God's plan, God's care, God's way, which surpasses human understanding. There's no doubt here. These are the presuppositions for the beginning of our salvation, the incarnation, but it's also the presuppositions for our own giving birth within us of the, of the Holy Spirit. And a great example of the mother of God for us. She is not an exception. She's the great example. She's the first of many who will follow in her footsteps in the sense of acquiring uh, full communion with God and achieving uh, or being given by the grace of God, being made worthy of glorification or deification or theosis. Let's listen to St. Maximus the Confessor a little bit about how this event is an example and one to be imitated and followed. Here's what St. Maximus says, which is so instructive for us. Because everything we're doing here, everything we, we do in church when we read and hear the scriptures, which are always applicable to every age and every person, 
it is as if you're reading and experiencing an ex- uh, the, the, the life that you lead when you read the gospel. It's not at all a, it's just a simple historical book, but it is a book which explains our very existence. And so when we go to the scriptures, we're looking for examples to imitate. St. Maximus says, The soul that through the grace of its calling resembles God keeps inviolate within itself the substance of the blessings bestowed upon it. In souls such as this, Christ always desires to be born in a mystical way, becoming incarnate in those who attain salvation, becoming incarnate in those who attain salvation, and making the soul that gives birth to him a virgin mother. You see how we're all called to imitate and follow in a spiritual way the mother of God. And here we see a truth that is so important for us today, that there is no difference today than with us who are in the eighth millennium, so to speak, the last Christians. There's no difference for us in approaching Christ than those who approach Christ during his life. In fact, we have a more intimate relationship with Christ because we actually partake of his body and blood within the church. And there is no the Lord is no respecter of persons. He's no, he makes no favorites. He does not say, I prefer those who lived and walked with me when I was yet on the earth as a man walking about. Uh, the same opportunities are given to us, and the same um, calling is for everyone, no matter what day or age, since the first until the second coming. So this is the great mystery the great mystery of the Incarnation. And why? And what, what is this mystery? Well, St. Theodore the Studite says to us in his catechism, his beautiful homily, short but filled with meaning about this feast, he says that the Son of God becomes the Son of Man, with the Holy Virgin as the means, dwelling in her and from her fashioning for himself a temple and becoming perfect man. Every one of us is called to become a temple of the Holy Spirit, to have As St. Maximus says, God, Christ, incarnate within us. And why is this so? He quotes St. Paul in understanding uh, the great mystery of the incarnation. He says that he might ransom those under the law and that we might receive sonship. Everything the Lord did and does. The incarnation from then until now is about our salvation. Everything in the church that's of the church and for the church and is for our salvation. It's all about us being returned to communion, full communion with God. This is our salvation. And this incarnation, this reception of sonship happened so that we might no longer be slaves, that we might be free, that we might be free from the passions, that we might become friends of God, and we might no longer walk according to the flesh, but according to the to the Spirit. These are some of the basic characteristics of our life in Christ if we are living a life in Christ and not simply going through the motions. Free of the passions, friends of God, walking according to the Spirit, not according to the flesh. Take your temperature, your spiritual temperature. How are you doing? How are we all doing? Are we free of the passions? Are we slaves to the passions? Are we friends with the world? Do we have friendship with the world? Does the world's ways and thinking appeal to us? Or the friends of God, the saints, and their way? Is that what inspires us and draws us and what we love with all our heart to be and imitate? Do we have the Spirit of God, which is not simply a virtue, but it's a, it's all the virtues together? The Spirit comes and dwells in man and gives him everything there's nothing just as we commune of the whole christ the spirit does not split into pieces so that we might have a bit of him he dwells in those who are uh, friends of god and free of the passions and gives those friends of god everything that he he can as much as we allow in romans saint paul's letter to the romans we read the following which helps us understand this great mystery Those who walk according to the flesh think the things of the flesh. And here he means 
the flesh, the fallen man, the lustful uh, uh, man who is uh, ruled by the passions. Those who walk according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the thought of the flesh is death, but the thought of the Spirit, life and peace. And so the thought of the flesh is hostile to God. It is not subject to the law of God. Indeed, it cannot be. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. The thought of the flesh is hostile to God, but it is not subject to the law of God. So here we see where St. Paul says elsewhere, those who are of Christ submit to him. This submission is key. If we come in the church and we withhold uh, in, and stand in judgment of the tradition of the church, of the teachings of the fathers, of the teachings of the gospel, and we say, well, I'll accept that, but I won't accept the other thing. I'll, I'll think about that commandment. Then we are not subject to the law of God, and we are uh, of the flesh, right? We're hostile to God. So this is the power of the mystery in a few words, and this is why we should celebrate spiritually and behave spiritually with holiness and justice and love, with gentleness and peace, with forbearance, with goodness, and with the Holy Spirit, as St. Paul says in his epistle to the Corinthians. So that, as far as we ourselves are concerned, we do not render the dispensation of our Lord Jesus Christ empty and ineffectual. So that is the feast of, the great feast of Annunciation, the first, the beginning of our redemption. A few words on the great feast. I want to go a little bit further. I want to talk about an aspect of the scriptures, scriptural readings we, 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 we hear on this feast. We see that this mystery does not only pertain to Nazareth, to Bethlehem, to Jerusalem. That is, the three years that our Lord walked this earth. The incarnation continues. For Christ continues with us in his church, in his body. And in that we are initiated into his body through baptism, chrismation, and the Eucharist, we are initiated into the ever-present in history, eternal incarnation, where Christ sits with our human nature at the right hand of the Father. Insofar as we are participating in the mysteries, we are already in this eternal mystery of the incarnation, which, is, which is, has begun but will never end. For Christ sits at the right hand of the Father in our, with our flesh, our human nature. The Eucharist, the divine liturgy, is in heaven. It's not an earthly event. We ascend every time we go to the divine liturgy. All together, every Sunday, all around the world, we are all together in the same one divine liturgy, the heavenly liturgy. It's not repeated. It's a, an event that never ends. It's a one, let's say, one time, not in time event, not time bound, not earthly, not fallen or limited. It's eternal. And we chant that in all the great feasts. Liturgically, we talk about today. Today is the day of salvation. Today, the Lord was born. Today, he entered the temple, etc. This is the eternal present of the liturgical life. This is why the divine liturgy and the holy mysteries and the liturgical life is, is just a non-negotiable part of our life. It's, it is our life. It is so central. And without it, we cease to be Christians. We cease to be disciples of Christ. It is in the Eucharist, through communion, that we are made a part of the theanthropic organism, which is his body. We become divine human members. This theanthropic, this this divine human reality of God, the God-man's body, we become a part of that. So, of course, any negation of participation in the mystery of the Church, in the Eucharist, is a negation of the very mystery of the continuation of the Incarnation in our lives and in history. It is unthinkable. Let's listen to what St. Paul says in his Epistle to the Hebrews, which is read on the Feast. He says, For both he who sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are of one. This is really important. This is this communion between God and man that he came to establish. And then he goes on in verse 14, Hebrews 3.14. And he says, Since then the children 
have partaken of flesh and blood, he also himself, he also himself in like manner partook of the same, in order that through death he might bring to naught the one who hath the power of death. That is the devil. Through death he brings to naught the one who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might set free those who f through fear of death, this is the key phrase, through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So this is a sign of the devil's power. What? Fear of death. Do Christians fear death? Not if they're true Christians, not if they're truly living out the life in Christ, not if they're truly initiated into the mystery of the Incarnation, death is no longer something that binds them. That bondage to the devil is no longer present. That's what separates them from the rest of the world. So to allow the fear of death to keep us from the unity with what, the one who has brought to naught the very power of death is, in fact, to reverse the Incarnation, the economy of salvation in our lives, not for not in terms of its power over the whole world and its and its reality in the world, but for us, insofar as we cut ourselves off from that reality. This is this is a key, key point in understanding not only the feast, obviously, but the, our, our life in Christ. We remember death. We do not fear it as Orthodox Christians. We remember it daily because we with remembrance of death what happens is it's kind of a vaccination, so to speak, against the diseases of worldliness. When you remember that you are leaving shortly this vain world, then all of those things which could have power over you and allure you lose their power and their control. So remembrance of death is absolutely essential, as is remembrance of God. Remember death, remember God, be in his presence. This is the whole point of the Jesus prayer and all the... All the psalms that were read and are read in the monasteries in the ancient days, every day, all the time, they would continually pray, pray unceasingly, as St. Paul teaches, precisely to not become complacent, not lose our time, which is for repentance. And a big part of that is remembrance of death, but not fear of death. Adios.